All right, I'm picking up where I left off last week. We have a grand total of 20 slides of new material left for this term. This is going to be pretty quick. <laughs> I'm just going to say. Um, so we're going to start with indexes. This is where I left off. Rude, your voice carries. All right. So, indexes. The purpose of indexes, summar up, summarize it in a single sentence before I go into the, you know, wordy slides, is to make queries go faster. That's what an index is for. All right. So, most of the time when you're writing an application and you're querying the database for information, you only need a small piece of data compared to, you know, you need one row out of millions, potentially. Therefore, if you use an index, it will speed up those kinds of queries. Because otherwise, if you don't have an index, it's, it does what's called a table scan. And it literally reads, does row one match? Yes. Does row two match? No. Does row three match? Yes. If you've got a million rows, it's going to do that test a million times. Um, it's really bad, very inefficient. Um, so, you know, with a textbook, and, you know, for those of you that remember what a physical textbook feels like, you know, you'd open the back because you're trying to figure out where a certain topic is, and you'd look at the index at the back, and it says go to page 23 for this topic. An index in a database basically serves the same purpose. It's basically an invisible data structure that you don't actually, you can't actually look at what's in it. You can see that it's defined, you can see its definition, but you can't see what is in it. And essentially what it does, it has a series of um, pieces of data in it that allows you to find things faster. Just like an index in a textbook, it's the same idea. So that's just a repeat, the first item. But the second item is primary keys are always automatically indexed. Why? Because normally when you're pulling records out of a database and you're trying to pull individual records, you're usually going at it via the primary key. Therefore, most good database engines will automatically index the primary key to make them go faster. Um, so. Other fields or combination fields can be used as indexes. Uh, these are usually called secondary indexes. Uh, ignore what's in the parentheses because that's a lie because they're not called non-unique indexes. They can be unique indexes, um, but usually they're non-unique. It's just, you know. Okay, so. An index the way it works is it creates something called a B tree, a B plus tree. And for the longest time, I thought that the B stood for binary tree. And then my mind was blown the day I found out that it was literally stood for best tree. Literally, the B stands for best. Like for the one time where some paper, you know pocket protector could have come up with a really good reason to call it something cool, and he goes, it's the best tree index. Okay, cool. So the way a B tree index works is this one's actually a better um, way to describe it. So it takes all the values in the table, divides them in half, takes each of those, divides them in half, like the, the values in the index, takes those, divides them in half, takes that, divides it in half, up to four layers deep. So the tree is only ever four branches high, but it could be, you know, insanely wide. Um, every once in a while, the database server has to do a little maintenance. It is basically called rebuilding the index where it scans all the data and updates the index. So it's all, you know, distributed properly across the tree. But using this example right here, so the database, the first layer is broken down to three pieces. So you got everything up till F, P, and then Z. So 
everything up to F means it'll have B, D, and F in it. And then the P section will be HLP, and the Z will have R, S, Z in this case. If we had more names, there'd be more letters at each level. And then, then that layer will be divided again into smaller pieces. So, you know, this is very similar to the game, the guess, guess a number between 1 and 10. What is the correct strategy for guessing for a number between 1 and 10? The fastest strategy. You pick the middle. Then somebody will say higher or lower. You'll pick the middle of that. The person will say higher or lower. Pick the middle of that. And at that point, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. That's basically what a binary tree does. It does subdivides the data multiple times so that in the end, it only needs to look at a specific set of data. So in this case, let's say we're looking for the devils. So the, the way it would work is that the index is on the name. So we'd go, name starts with D. Okay, it's, le it's less than or equal to F. We're going to go down to that block. Then it's going to go, okay, is it smaller or equal to B? No. Is it D or E? Okay, yes. Then it'll jump down again until it's to the point where there's not a lot left. And then at that point, it only has a very small subset it needs to worry about scanning, which will speed everything up. Hey? Yeah. That's literally what a binary tree does, a best tree does, a B tree does, is it divides the data piece by piece until there's nothing left. Okay, so there are unique indexes. Usually it's just primary keys that are considered unique, although you could apply it to other fields. Um, a common one you would see was email or a SIN number, that kind of thing where you have to make sure that duplicates don't happen. Um, then you've got non-unique indexes, which are usually done for fields that are often used to group individual entities together. Um, things like, like a postal code, a zip code, product categories. Um, and the syntax is as it shows right here. It's like create index, give it a name on, you give the name of the table and then the field that's applied. <clears throat> and there's another example of that. So you can create indexes that work across multiple attributes or multiple fields. So for example, if you you can't consistently search for a person's age in certain cities, you could create an index that indexes a person's age in the city. So what would happen with that index is it would help with the first query where you're actually specifying both elements. But if you're only specifying one of the elements, that index will not be used. The, like I really don't know about the internals very much at all. Uh, different database servers do it slightly differently and they offer different types of indexes. Um, but essentially the way it works is the query optimizer will look at your query and it'll look at anything you have in your where clause and say, do we have any indexes that match one or more of these columns? Do we have any of these in combination? And then it tries to guess the best index to use. Um, it keeps stats, like there's internal stats and stuff like that for the indexes. So you know, it gets pretty intelligent. Um, but it will find the index that works the best. And if it's a multi-column index, but you're only pulling on one column, that means that one column is not in a valid index as far as it's concerned. So in this case, you'd probably end up creating two indexes, one for the city and then one for the combination of the two. Uh, alternatively, you create two separate indexes, one for age, one for city. It would not be as efficient as a combi combined index, but it would still be better than not having an index at all. All right, so before I move on to the next topic, there are a few other gotchas when it comes to indexes. Indexes come with a price. Everybody in here should know by now nothing in life is free. Because then whenever you get anything for free, there's usually somewhere there's a string attached to it. Rarely is it, you know, really free. And indexes are the same thing. A lot of people, when they first start, go, 
indexes are fantastic. Look at this. I added this one index and poof, everything's running like 80% faster. It's freaking amazing. So then they go to town, start creating more and more indexes. However, there's two sets of catches. Notice I said the word set, not just two catches, two sets of catches, but they're related to each other. The first one is for every index you have, you are adding overhead. So if, for example, you add a row to the database, that is one operation, let's say. There's actually more than one operation, but we'll say that's one operation. It's writing the data to the table. Then it's gonna go through every index, read the index, figure out where to put the information, and write it to that index. So for every single time you add a row, it's also doing at least three more operations for every index. And if you've got like five or six indexes and it's a very chunky table, you're adding latency to your writes. You're slowing things down. And not all database engines are able to defer indexes. Um, I guarantee MySQL does not defer index updates at all. Um, by default, Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server don't defer indexes unless you tell it to do it but then there's always a risk that your searches are going to be wacky for only a few seconds. But, you know, there's always a bit of a lag. Um, which brings me to the related item to that. Indexes take up this space. I've seen a case where the database table itself was maybe two or three megabytes of text. I know everybody in here going, ah, three megabytes, that's not that big. My phone takes bigger pictures than that. Three megabytes of text is an awful lot of text. And then dude decided he was gonna index every column and then combinations of every column. The indexes were occupying 10 megabytes. The indexes were taking up more room than the actual data itself. Now, the good thing is during backups, the indexes don't get picked up. They get rebuilt on restore. So. As far as backups and stuff are concerned, indexes don't hurt, but they take up room. So now imagine if this database table was not, you know, say three megabytes, and it's like I've got one uh, table in my production environment that sits closer to two and a half gigabytes because it's, it's a chonker. It's got tons of data in it, huge amounts of text, and there's binary data stored in it too. And there's indexes, very, very few indexes. But imagine if I started doing the crazy thing, so I started indexing, you know, all these random fields. Easily I could eat up, you know, a good portion of a small hard drive with that. Hard drive space is cheap. Yes. However, downtime while you have to upgrade the hard drive is not so cheap. Not everybody gets to do the Amazon thing where I go, Increase the volume size, click, 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 and then just go have a beer for 20 minutes, come back and it's done. And it magically grew the volume size. Not all database work is beer fueled like that. A lot of it is caffeine fueled and terror. Uh, well, well, it's the truth when you're sitting there working on a live production environment and things go horribly wrong. Trust me, you spend an awful lot of time terrorized when you have to do things to the production environment. So indexes are good, they come at a price. The last piece of the gotchas is, if you have too many indexes, the query optimizer will start getting confused. Instead of having to pick between one and five possible choices, if you've got 20 indexes, it's gonna go, hmm, he's querying on this column and he's querying on that column. These two columns show up in this index, but they're also individually indexed. And then there's, you know, this other index that does something too. And it goes after a while, it goes, you know what? I don't know what to do anymore. Table flip, table scan. And then it scans every record from top to bottom because it can't make a decision. The query optimizer's job is to make a decision. And if it can't make one, it will decide very quickly that it doesn't want to do it. And then it'll bail and go with the least optimal solution that will at least get you records. Um, also nulls run chaos on indexes. Don't index columns that have nulls. Why? Because 
if you're searching and it picks that index as its optimization routine, it'll exclude anything that has nulls. <laughs> so don't index things that have nulls. So those are the basic rules of engagement when it comes to indexes and you know the potential side effects. All right, so last topic for this term is transactions. Transactions is a very important topic. We are going to just gloss over it. Um, like I know, I know someone who went to university, took a degree, and they spent almost an entire course dedicated to transactions. He actually understands what happens inside the database server during the transaction. I'm just glad it does what it does. So a transaction is something that allows the financial world to exist. It's something that allows medical records to exist. But really, transactions were invented by the financial institutions. They're the ones that said this had to happen. So a transaction is a unit of work that changes the state of the database. Okay, cool. So insert a row, that's a transaction. Update a row, transaction. Delete a row, that's also a transaction. Cool. However, the key word here is a unit of work, not a statement. A unit of work is all the steps involved in a given transaction. So the easiest example I like to use is you're gonna transfer money from one bank account to another bank account. Most of you will sit there and go tap. Then if, you're, if you've got a good phone, you go thumbprint. And then you go transfer, checking to savings or savings to checkings, depending on which way your life is going at that point in time. And you pick an amount of money and you go transfer. As far as you're concerned, magically the money just went from one place to another place. But that's not actually what happens inside the banking system. So as a super simplified approach to this, it'll start a work of unit, a unit of work. It'll say, okay, Dan wants to transfer 200 bucks from checking to saving, so he can pull it out in 20 minutes and spend it, but he just wants to transfer it for now. $200 from checking to saving. So different banks do this slightly differently, but they all do basically the same steps. It'll go checking account, fantastic. Saving account, fantastic, good, they're there. Savings account, plus 200. At this point in time, both bank accounts have the $200. If it knows for a fact that $200 went into the savings, then it'll go to check and go minus 200. And suddenly the money magically, as far as you're concerned, has disappeared from one account and appeared in the other account. But what it actually did was four or five steps to make sure that the money went from A to B. I remember way back in the day where you couldn't do money transfers on the weekend. You're too young to remember how archaic banking used to be. Uh, if you actually want to transfer money, you actually have to go to the teller and they did it. And what they actually did was literally that. They go savings plus 200. Then they go to check in minus 200. And then they'd hit a button and then they would, this is how they're doing it. Um, and actual fact, it's not really that different even now. They've just managed to make it look a little prettier. Um, so that is called a sequential group of statements. In other words, for a simple job like transferring money from account A to account B, there are certain steps that have to occur. They have to occur, they have to succeed, and they cannot fail. Otherwise, the transaction is considered invalid and everything has to go back to the way it was before everything started. So if everything succeeds properly, it's said to be the transaction will be committed. If the changes are undone, it's said to be rolled back. So, MySQL's transactions are extra special. 
Um, there's actually a point on here that is not listed on the slide, which I will mention at the end of no, this slide. So on MySQL, transactions end explicitly when you, they either in, encounter a commit or a rollback command. I'll be demonstrating all this stuff in a minute. So you start the transaction, you do some stuff, either commit or rollback happens. It's at that point considered to be explicitly ended. It will end implicitly if they encounter a DDL command. So you go, you know, begin, do an insert. Then you go, oh shoot, I forgot. I needed to add a column to this table. And you go alter table. That insert's now committed automatically without you knowing. Um, and the third point is MySQL supports uh, transactions, but only if you have one specific table engine. So remember at the start of the term, lab one, when I had you go and change, make sure that the default engine for tables was NODB. If you're not using NODB, MySQL pretends it's doing the transaction. Like it won't tell you it can't do it. It just, you go begin, you do insert, insert, couple of other things, blah, 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 blah. And at that point, you could just shut down the connection and all those changes still happen because it never actually started the transaction. It just rolled as in single statement transactions. Um, so that's why I had you guys ever set your defaults in ODB. And when you look at lab 10, there's a specific spot that tells you to run these commands just to be on the safe side. That's why. Okay. So when we're talking about transactions, there are four characteristics. And it's an acronym called ACID. Not that kind. See, he started giggling the second I said ACID. Dude, it's not the time, it's not the right time of year. So, so ACID, A stands for atomic. It refers to the fact that every statement within the group is required to be performed successfully. So a, so a transaction is atomic. In other words, even if it's five or six steps, it's still considered one task. Let's picture getting out of bed in the morning. There is, to successfully get out of bed, you are standing next to the bed. The unit of work is the alarm went off and you're going to somehow get your sorry carcass out of the bed to a standing position. This morning really sucked. There might have been a couple of snoozes. But think about all the steps involved in actually getting your your yourself out of bed in the morning. Right? You're going to uncover yourself. You might open your eyes. You know, you might roll over. You might pull your thumb out of your mouth. There's all kinds of steps, right? Each people, everybody's a little different. But there's a series of steps when you get up in the morning. <clears throat> so, getting out of bed is a single task that's considered atomic. All the little pieces that make it up is all part of that one transaction. So it's atomic. So either all the steps work or the whole thing fails. That's atomic. Consistent. Consistent means that the state of the database is modified only when it's committed successfully. In other words, all the changes you're doing are happening on the side, once you hit commit, it will apply them. So even if you have 25 steps, the state is you have to be, it has to be consistent before and after. It doesn't care what's happening in between. Again, to go back to our getting out of bed example. Imagine you're getting out of bed and somehow you're still laying in bed, but yet there's a cop of you standing next to you looking down, going, What the frick just happened? When things are not consistent, that's what happens. If we go back to our transferring money from one bank account to the other, if we did it like how CIBC used to do it, which was negative the account first and then add the value to the second account and the transaction would fail, you'd be minus $200 in one account and the money has now disappeared out of your bank account. That was how their banking system used to run. I have that. As a firm fact, I know someone who used to work in their COBOL systems. And that's literally how they did their transactions is negative first, positive second. Because they'd rather have someone lose money than them give somebody money. 
That was the official policy behind that logic. Is it a bank? Yes. <laughs> That's how they work, right? They'd rather take your money than give you money. So the other advantage of the consistency is also it protects data from crashes. In other words, the transaction starts, the server shits the bed because the transaction's happening in its own little separate space. The main data line's not damaged. Isolation. So it means that every time a a group of commands operates, it is operating in isolation, away from everything else. Once again, so I'm saying you know it's operating off to the side until it succeeds, and then it magically gets applied. Uh, it also means that the transact the the steps are transparent to each other. They don't you don't actually see them happening. So you could have two different transactions running side by side. And neither of them is aware that the other one is happening. It's, imagine if you were coming to class. Actually, this is easy. COVID. During COVID, we were all doing remote classes for those of us that were involved in remote classes during COVID. Each of you were most likely sitting by yourselves. Yet you were participating in a class, but you were all isolated from each other. You could do whatever you wanted as long as your camera was off. And nobody would know the difference until you chirped up and participated. Same idea, isolation. Each piece of work happens by itself. None of the other pieces of work are aware of it. The mainline database is not aware that there's work happening to the side. It just suddenly knows that wham, shit has happened. And the last one is durability. So when a transaction is committed, It is committed. There's no if, there's no ands, and there's no buts. Once it's written to the disk, the server could blow up right then and there. The server comes back after the reboot, and the data is still there. That's durability. Again, very important in the banking industry. Okay. So in MySQL, there's two ways of starting a transaction. And there's the long one, which is, you know, start transaction, which is MySQL specific. Or you could use the industry standard one, which is called begin. Begin is great. It's nice and short. Um, <clears throat> there's also one called begin work, but begin does the trick. Commit is used to commit the current transaction. In other words, all the steps work, it's good, commit it, done. It's being written to the disk. So you're taking it off the scratch pad and you're applying it to the actual disk. Then you've got rollback, which is used to roll back a transaction. In other words, you don't like what's happening, you're going to undo your changes. Um, and you can set the MySQL to be auto commit off which means that even if you do an insert statement and you just run it without a begin statement, um, normally if you do that, you've all experienced it already, you know, automatically add a row to the table the second you run the insert statement. However, if you turn that off, it'll behave like Oracle where you actually have to tell it to commit your changes every single time. Uh, that's basically a compatibility thing. So I am going to go demonstrate some of this stuff. And... I need another connection. Okay, so to do this demo, you guys will notice that I've got two tabs open to my local machine. These are two separate connections. As far as they're concerned, as far as my skill is concerned, it's literally two different computers talking to it. You don't need to do anything special. You just open up two connections. It's all cool. So I've got a table called transaction, well, it's a database called transaction demo. I just created it literally for these demos. And I've got a single column here called trans demo. It's got two columns, ID and name. So right now, in this one here, I'm going to hit run. You can see that I got my three rows. So I'm going to do my first one here, which is going to be insert into trans demo name values. All right. I'm going to run this and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see what's happening. So that ran. If I come to my first tab, you can see that Julie now exists. 
Congratulations. Julie exists. Now, what I'm going to do is in front of this, I'm going to add the begin keyword. And um, and I'm going to run this whole block. So I'm going to issue a begin command. So I'm telling MySQL, you are now starting a, a proper controlled transaction. I'm going to insert a row into this table, and then I'm going to select to prove that it exists. So you can see right here, Andrew exists. Cool, right? I, there's thing that's nothing new. Let me go to my first connection. Andrea does not exist in my first connection because it is currently in a transaction block in the other connection. Picture me moving money from one account to another. I'm moving money around. The transaction has begun. The transaction did not complete. Therefore, now this connection has data that this one does not have. So if I were to issue a commit command like this, and I'm going to, just going to run just this one command, right? So it shows no rows affected. Now if I go back to my first one, Andrea is now there. Because now what's happened is I completed the transaction, told the database server, I'm good. I'm happy with all these steps that I just did, even though I just did one step. You can write this to the database. Now it's done. So now let's go and pop in, uh, let's put in a Jake in here. So this is something you've seen before. Okay, Jake sitting at position number seven. I come back to my first window, again, proving that Jake does not exist yet. And instead here, I'm gonna issue a rollback. And I'm gonna run that. So now, if I were to, in this window, run this command, Jake does not exist, and Jake does not exist. I just erased Jake from reality. Well. Try that again. Then Jake would, have, would be there. No, once you've committed, that's it. Yes. That's what the point, the variability, the D in acid. Yep. Oh, I mean, you mean like update something? Sure. Actually, I'm going to go add Jake. I'm going to go update uh, trans demo um, set name equal to. Okay, and I'm not going to have this command here. Okay, so I'm going to add a Jake, and Frank is going to become Francine. And I'm going to run the whole thing. And I run this. Now you can see that Frank became Francine and Jake exists. If I were to roll back, now if I go back to my first instance, run this, Frank is still Frank. If I were to commit, Frank becomes Francine, Jake is added to the database. If I were to roll back, Frank decided not to become Francine, and Jake was never created. Yes, exactly. So the A for this means that atomic means that both of these commands have to work. Consistent means right now, while the transaction is happening, the database is consistent. Nothing has changed until I commit. And then the changes are applied. Now the database is consistent with the changes that were applied. Isolation means that this tab, everything I'm doing in this tab because I issued the begin command is happening in isolation from everything else. Like in theory, let's go do another one of these. Let's go. Uh, I've never actually done the demo with three of these happening at the same time. So this should be fun. Um, 
and uh, okay and actually I want this last bit here because this should be interesting and in how this is all going to roll out so I go this so you can see Roberta, Roberta got renamed now in this one here everything is literally way I wanted it to be and now this one is how it was originally so right now I've got two transactions happening in isolation from each other outside of the mainline database so now let's go see when I commit these out of order because you know this one started after the first one so I'm going to commit that and let's go see what's happening over here so we can see that Bob became Roberta and we have a Jane down here. And now I'm gonna commit this one. And do this and Francine and Jake exist. And you notice, look at the IDs. It actually kept track of where the IDs are supposed to be between the transactions. So even though the transactions are happening in isolation, it knows enough which IDs to grab to keep things consistent happening. So that's transactions in a nutshell. There are tons of other things you can do, which I'm now gonna cover, but this is the important part of the demo is understanding this. Um, there's tons of other little bits and pieces have to do with that. What happens if you're both playing with the same record at the same time, which one wins, which one doesn't win. Um, and that's, you know, literally like a lecture, that's a topic for like two, three lectures. So. The other thing we can do is called the save point. Um, in the database, the save point statement is used to mark a spot in the transaction. So let's just say that we have a transaction that is actually multiple, many steps, not just multiple, like several steps. And it just so happens to be that as long as steps one, two, and three are valid, we can disregard the rest because maybe there's some value added stuff that you can do, like maybe adding records to a log, updating some cache, something like that. And essentially what that allows you to do is you can roll back part of the transaction and still keep everything happened to that point. So you can do a rollback to a save point, which if you create a save point, you give it a number like save point one, you can go roll back to save point one. So that means it'll step back a certain number of steps. Uh, if you create two or three save points, you can roll back to just parts of these save points if you want. Um, if you don't identify the rollback, specific targeted rollback, it'll only roll back to the most recent save point. It's just like, you know, when you're playing video games and you hit that magic save point and you only got like one bullet left and you're at 5% health and you really didn't want to trigger that save point because now you're screwed. Because every single time you die, it's going to reload that save point for you with that one bullet and the 2% health. We've never, I've never experienced that in Rage Quit. But this is the same idea where the rollback will go back to the most recent save point, unless you tell it to go back to pull up an older save point. Um, you can do a release save point, which means you reached a certain point, you go, okay, these worked, fantastic. Now these next three steps worked good. We can release the previous save point so we don't need, so if we want to roll back, we can roll back the whole thing. I mean, 99% of the transactions you'll deal with in the real world will not have these. Um, you see these in really complex systems where you know it has to touch like 25 tables for any given task to happen. And even then, that's rare because you still want all those 25 tables to, to have it, right? So the whole thing works or it doesn't work. Um, so literally, save point, you give it a name, roll back to save point, release save point. That's the syntax on that. Okay, so that's transactions. Um, I actually have one more slide for transactions I want to show you guys, but it's actually for a different course. Um, but it is a really handy one to understand uh, 
Is it this one that I want? Okay, yes. Okay. So database servers, there's things called checkpoints that happen. And um, I'm just going to make this full screen. So remember a minute ago, I was showing you the different trans transactions that someone were happening in parallel. So the way database servers work is it's not constantly writing to the disk. It's got a, what they call a transaction log. And every so many hundredths of a second or every second or whatever, whatever the timing is defined to be, it will take those changes and apply them to whatever's on the disk. So it saves them in memory, then applies them to the disk every once in a while. They're called checkpoints. So here we have five checkpoints. I mean, five transactions. And we have a checkpoint, which means right here means this is when it was saved to the disk. And then you got the system failure, which is the computer shit the bed for the technical term. So the way it works is there's certain steps that happen during a transaction. And there's a state called undo and redo. So at the checkpoint, we have a couple of different transactions. Transaction one. Transaction one started and ended before the checkpoint. It's free and clear. It has nothing to worry about. It's been applied to the disk. Transaction two and transaction three started before the checkpoint. And so then the checkpoint happens. So essentially what happens is um, transactions two and three are active. Four and five have not happened yet. So currently, transaction two and transaction three are considered to be in, put into the undo pile because they haven't been committed yet and they haven't been written to the disk. If the server were to blow up at that moment, those transactions didn't complete, so they should not be applied at recovery. Therefore, they go with into it's called the undo pile. Now, our point in time just moved over just a little bit. Transaction four begins. So currently, transaction four has now been added to the undo pile. So it's sitting in two, three, and four. The line moves forward a little bit. Transaction five begins. Also been added to the undo pile. So we have two, three, four, and five all existing in memory, waiting for their moment to shine. Transaction two completes. Suddenly, transaction two gets moved from undo into the redo pile because it is complete unto itself. Therefore, if the server were to blow up right now and it comes back up, it'll look at the transaction log and say, hey, transaction two started before the checkpoint, but it was not completed. So let's redo it because it's valid. Transaction four completes, it gets added to the redo pile also. And now, picture one more step. We hit the line of failure, this bad boy right here. Three and five are still in the undo pile. So on recovery, it'll look at those and go, yeah, you never finished the job, it's trash. Yeah. Uh, hopefully never. Uh, how often does it happen? It's I've seen it happen to me twice in 26 years. Well, no, this is exactly how it's supposed to behave. Um, so what, what would happen is the transaction, for example, picture this, you go to transfer money, okay? And for some unknown reason, their old COBOL systems are being extra pokey. So... You start the transaction, minus $200 out of your checking account, server shits the bed because it never added the $200 to your savings account. On the recovery, it would look at that and say, that never happened. It's in the undo pile. It pretend it never even happened. So magically, your main bank account still has its $200. That's literally what the transaction's for. And that's rare that there's like critical failures in this stuff. 
Uh, mind you, I wouldn't run, want to run a financial organization on MySQL. Um, considering it has some really quirky behavior with transactions um, compared to other servers, but you know, it is what it is. So that is what I want. The last little bit I want to talk about transactions it wasn't in the main line slides. It's not going to be on the exam, but it's kind of important to understand what happens when certain things happen in the computer. And that's what this was. Okay. So that having been said, um, I've had one person ask me for a group. I really don't know what to do with them. It's a little late considering I've about a third of the groups have already submitted their work. Um, if anybody is still looking for a partner outside that one person and you know who you are, email me. I'll handshake you. Outside of that, that person might be a SOL and they're doing the work on their own. It's a little late to be looking for a partner when there's four days left for it to do. So lab nine is due Friday. Simon is to be submitted Sunday night. And there are no extensions this time. Because bruh, we got a week left after this. Like next week is your last week of class. Okay. Hybrids, what a shitty way to lose, you know, a couple percentage off your grade for not doing your hybrids. And so what's going to happen next week? Oh, hang on. 